Let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, that you're our cornerstone. And as we open your word here, I pray that you would use it to speak to us, that you would use it to teach us, to encourage us or to convict us. And as we look at the example of Stephen and the godly character that he portrayed, I pray that we would find his life instructive for ours. Help us to live with character and to see what that means. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, I read a story this week uh, about Ruth Bell, or Ruth, yeah, Ruth, Ruth Bell, who would later marry Billy Graham, become Ruth Bell Graham. Um, she grew up, at least largely, in China. Her parents were missionaries in China. And I am sure uh, that growing up there and in, in, in her, that generation of missionary service, that she heard all these stories of martyrdom, right? I would, I would imagine that to be the case. And um, the story is told that, that when she was a child, that she had this passion for martyrdom. And that... Um, and that she would pray every night that the Lord would let her be a martyr before the end of the year, right? That was her. She wanted to be a martyr, right? And um, she wanted bandits to capture her and maybe even to behead her for Jesus' sake, right? She wanted to die for Jesus. It's, it's a little girl on the mission field, so let's cut her a little slack. It's an odd thing. But um, her sister, Rosa, used to think how horrible that was. And so every night when Ruth prayed like that, Rosa would pray to counteract her, Lord, don't you listen to her. And I don't think we need to pray for martyrdom. Martyrdom? It's a difficult word, isn't it? Um, like we sh should seek that out as our goal. But I do think we should desire, we should strive to imitate the, the kind of witness that those Christian martyrs had, right? That, um, that the kind of life, the level of commitment. Like, I'm not sure that we need to make martyrdom our goal, but I do think that the kind of witness, that kind of boldness, maybe that should be our goal. Stephen, who we read about last week, last week we we're in Acts 6, in the first seven verses and we talked about these first seven men who were um, given the task, the role of what we now call deacon. And Stephen was the first man in that list and it describes him as being full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. It describes that of all of them. I mean, it's very pointedly about Stephen. Uh, we also know that Stephen was the first Christian martyr and we'll get to that uh, over the next couple of weeks. But we know that he left us an example of a godly witness and a courageous witness. He did not back down. He was a man of character and integrity who maintained that to his last breath. In fact, his name, the name Stephen, uh, the, that Greek name, that word means the victor's crown. This would be like the Olympic runners would get a victor's crown. You have, to, you have to earn that. And not that we earn our salvation, but the Bible does talk about rewards and things. And, and Stephen is an example of somebody who worked and, and earned this victor's crown. So today we're going to look a little bit at Stephen's character. Now, <coughs> next week we're going to look at um, the message that he preached. Now, I'm going to go ahead and let you know Next week, I'm going to work really hard to preach a very short sermon because it is a very large passage. And we're going to, there's not a great way to break it up, I mean, without breaking it up into lots and lots of little bitty pieces. We're going to look at all of, uh, almost all of chapter 7 next week. And it's a long chapter. Let's see, we're going to look at 53 verse, <clears throat> verses. Um, 
We're going to look at ch chapter 7, verses 1 through 53 next week. We're not going to do a detailed study, so please come and don't panic. I do think it's fair to be honest. So we're going to look at the message Stephen preaches on his way to his death, and then the last week of, the, of our series, which is two weeks from now, will be about Stephen's martyrdom. So as we look at Stephen today, we're going to... I think the big lesson, if there is one, the big lesson is that godly character is the basis for a courageous witness for Christ. And that's true regardless of what the results are. Whether people respond or not, whether you, you uh, are mistreated or tormented or persecuted, or in the case of Stephen, even killed for that, or not, that if we want to be the bold, courageous witnesses for Jesus that I think we are called to be and I think the scripture teaches that we're called to be, we cannot really do that effectively if we don't possess godly character, if we don't live that message out. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that a person can't be a witness until they're a mature disciple, right? You don't have to develop mature character before you can witness. In fact, I, some of the most effective witnesses are people who are brand new baby Christians because it's a new change and they're excited about this great thing. Listen, that's true. That's true in every aspect of our lives, right? When you, you buy a new car, you're excited about it and you tell people about it, right? You enjoy food at a great new restaurant. You tell people about it, right? Because it's a new thing. People who come to know Jesus and have this change in their life, they often are great witnesses because they're excited about it. What happens, we often, as we mature, our excitement wanes as our maturity grows. And maybe that's not really fair. Maybe as our test time grows, we're not really that much more mature. Because I think if we really do mature in our faith in healthy ways, our witness shouldn't really diminish. Now, the way we witness might, but the fact that we witness shouldn't. Um... I'm saying, though, that godly character gives us the most solid foundation for a powerful witness. I think it's especially true when there's any level of persecution. So last week we talked about these seven men being chosen to uh, be given this task of, of being deacons. Uh, the church is growing rapidly. Some estimate there are as many as 25,000 in the Jerusalem church. 25,000. Um, there are 12 elders. These are the 12 apostles. They're the ones who are teaching the word and preaching the gospel. And now others are doing so too. I mean, we learned that about Stephen today. But, but they're the ones who are leading the church. And so as the church is growing and, and expanding and maturing and people are coming to know Jesus and coming to love Jesus and to be part of the church, uh, you know, Satan does this. He... He sets his sights on some way to try to slow that down or destroy it or, or, or break it up or whatever it is. And, and this is how he does this, is by attacking Stephen, who's doing great things, great things for Jesus. And so, um, so let's read in chapter 6, where we left off last week. Chapter 6, we're going to be again in verse 8. Now remember, verse 7 said that there were all these people who were still coming to Jesus, including lots of priests who were turning to the faith. And I do think it's worth saying that they were no less Jewish. I totally must say that the, the numbers, the estimates are right. There are 25,000 Christians in Jerusalem. They're all Jewish. Like the, even, even that deacon last week, he was a convert to Judaism who became a Christian. Right? And they're all... They're all Jewish. They still go to the synagogue. They still read the Old Testament. They still pray. They still they are widely seen as a sect, a religious sect within Judaism, a religious movement, a subset of Judaism. And we're going to see that change as our series ends with the martyrdom of Stephen. We're going to see that start to change as it kind of branches out because not long after that, it will pick up with Acts again sometime next year or two, uh, they, we'll see that, that the first Gentile believers who were not, who had not converted to Judaism, the first Gentile believers come into the church. And that really changes things. They're no longer a sect of Judaism. So let's begin 
Uh, all these priests are coming to know Jesus, and then you come to verse 8 where we start today. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, so he's full of faith, he's full of the Holy Spirit, he's full of wisdom, and he's full of grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place, speaking of the temple, this holy place, and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses handed down to us. Now does that sound familiar? Do you remember when Jesus made the comment about his own death and resurrection that you destroy this temple, speaking of him, himself, you destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up, right? And so he's speaking of his crucifixion and his resurrection. Resurrection. So Stephen has clearly sat under the teaching of Jesus and has been talking about the destruction of the temple. Now when Stephen talks about it, he's not talking about Jesus' body, he's talking about the destruction uh, of, of the law in terms of it being how they viewed the source of their salvation. Right? They think they're saved by keeping the law. And Stephen says, no, no, no. That's not how this works, right? This temple will be destroyed and um, and the law has been fulfilled in Jesus in his resurrection. He basically just taught what Jesus taught, but remember when Jesus was on trial, that was one of the charges, right? He, this man said he would destroy the temple. And that's not what Jesus said, right? They twisted his words. The same is happening here. I have no doubt that Stephen has been teaching and preaching about the quote-unquote destruction of the temple and the law of Moses. And the people who are bringing these charges, they've taken those words, they've intentionally twisted them to mean what they want them to mean so that they can bring a charge against them. Verse 15. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. I don't know what that means exactly, right? We're, we'll get to that at the very end. We'll conclude with some thoughts about that. So Stephen possesses this godly character. And I don't just mean the way in this world that we talk about character, right? A man of character. You know, because there are people who are described as a person of character, and it's clearly not a godly character, right? They're generally good people, but... You can tell that's not rooted in any kind of faith, right? It's not rooted in an understanding of what Jesus taught. It's just that they try their best to be good people. And we, we count that as being of good character. Stephen was full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit and full of grace, full of faith. He's full of power. In fact, he has an apostolic-like ministry. And see, he's not one of the apostles. We talked about this, how, how the Holy Spirit and the work of the church is not just for the ones in charge, right? The, and here's a great illustration of that. The apostles were doing this stuff. That was their calling, right? From the days Jesus first called them. That was the goal, was that He would disciple them and they would go out and do these great things. But it didn't end with them. Here's Stephen who who may or may not have ever met Jesus personally. Here is Stephen who is doing these signs and wonders just like the apostles did. And, and I'm going to tell you what I think is that um, to be a man, or to be a person of godly character, it really starts with, a, with being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I don't mean 
repeated, ecstatic, spontaneous, sort of modern charismatic type movements. I don't want to get into all of that, but I'm telling you what I think it means is that he is living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? He's living a life of faith. He is living out God's grace. He is exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit. That's somebody who is continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. The word, in fact, um, that that says full, I mean, it really, the word for full, when it says he's full of the Holy Spirit, it means, this is complicated, it means full. Like it means like a vessel that is full, that you cannot put more in because it is full. Here's what that means. That means that as Stephen is ministering, he's not ministering in his own power. He's ministering the power of the Holy Spirit that is overflowing, right? He is so full that the Holy Spirit is overflowing in his life. And so, how do we, how do we live a life that we are so filled with the Holy Spirit that that the Holy Spirit is overflowing. I'm going to be honest, right? So when I get up and preach, it should just flow out like the Holy Spirit flowing out. It doesn't mean I shouldn't study and prepare and make notes, right? The Holy Spirit can flow out on Tuesday, you know, in front of my computer, just like He can flow out on Sunday morning in front of the room. But it shouldn't be me having to just come up with great logical arguments and, 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 and great outlines and I've got to figure out how to make it all work, right? It should be the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of Sundays uh, it's the Holy Spirit working after the fact. Because it's hard to stay full of the Holy Spirit. That's not a natural, you know what I mean? It's not a natural thing. It doesn't just happen. It's something we have to be intentional about. And you know, I've probably said this enough times to where you said, really, are you saying that again? Let me say it. Say it with me, you know. How do, you, how do we stay filled with the Holy Spirit? How do we look like Jesus? How do we live in the power of God's grace? And how do we mature in our faith? The, probably the most effective means are the most simple. And that is we spend lots of time in God's Word and lots of time with God's people. Right? That's how... That's how this works. That's how we experience real, genuine growth. So we spend time in God's Word and we spend time with God's people. This is where He has spoken to us. He wrote those things or He inspired those things to be written for our benefit so that we can mature and we can grow. So that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. When I think of this word full like it is here, full of faith, full of grace, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, full of power. I think of that old commercial for Brim. You remember the Brim coffee commercials, the cup, and it's just right at the top. It's filled to the rim with Brim. Oh, come on. Y'all are older than me. You should remember that. Filled to the, and this is Stephen with all of these things, right? My grandmother. Oh, God bless her. My grandmother um, would fill up a coffee cup and walk across her room and she had this trimmer. And we teased her. She couldn't eat. You know, she'd get a fork full of peas and get one to her mouth or something. And we were kids and we would tease her and it was mean and I know and I'm sorry. But she would make a cup of coffee and walk across to the table doing, you know, shaking like this. And I never saw her spill a drop of coffee. Full as she could get her cup. It was like her trimmer was in time with the waves that she made inside the cup. It was a miraculous thing, right? Her cup was full to the point of overflowing. Stephen was full to the point of overflowing. He had a deep communion with the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the sign of, a care, of the, this godly character. This is the way this godly character is a deep communion with the Holy Spirit. Ravi Zacharias says this. He says, what's the difference between companionship and and communion. Now think about that for a minute. We think about companionship with God. Companionship with the Holy Spirit. And I think he calls us to something more. He says in comparison, or in companionship with God, 
we come to Him recognizing our limit of strength in communion with God. We stay with Him, recognizing our depth of spirit. In companionship with God, we long to see and to understand. In communion with God, we long to feel and belong. We want to, we want to be with. Companionship is like two friends hanging out. The communion is so much closer, right? That's a genuine with. Those who seek companionship without communion seek power without commitment, a display without dedication, and proof without love. I think that um, that if we're going to see any kind of revival within our church, and I don't mean a, a three-day or a seven-day or a whatever-day campaign, right? If we're going to see the Holy Spirit spark and work come alive within us as a church I think it starts with a restoration of this sense of closeness with God with me. if we as a church are going to experience communion with God if we're going to experience um, this fullness of the Holy Spirit we're going to do that as a church. It starts with me being full of the Holy Spirit. And it starts with you being full of the Holy Spirit. Like, I can't be full for you. You can't be full for me. We have to do this individually and together. There's this cliche, you know, about that uh, Christianity, our faith, is not about a religion, it's about a relationship. And, and, and that's true. But I don't think we really believe that. And, and here's why, right? It's because relationships are hard work. And we don't like to do hard work. We don't invest in our marriages the way we should. We don't inject, invest in our you know, parent-child relationships the way we should. We don't invest in our relationship with Jesus the way we should, our relationship with the Holy Spirit the way we should. Do you really, really love Him? Do you really, really desire Him? Do you really, like, do you really, really spend time in prayer? Do you really, really spend time in the Word? So in the average evangelical church, not the average church, the average evangelical church, Less than 50% of people read their Bible more than once a week. Less than 20% read their Bible every day. And, and I would say that, if I, I'm, I don't know this, I'm guessing, but I would say they would be willing to be generous with the expression every day. Right? I bet they would allow five days a week to be called every day. You know what I mean? Like, we're busy on Saturdays. I need to get time today. It's okay. I read it every day. I, I'm just saying. We can't expect to have deep communion with the God of the universe, with the author of Scripture, if we don't read what He wrote. And if we don't spend time in prayer to Him. And if we don't spend time with the people that He has saved. We can't expect to have deep communion if we don't pursue that. Stephen had deep communion with the Holy Spirit. He also had a deep commitment. Now how do we know this? Well, we know that he was willing to debate, discuss, preach, and teach with practicing, active, believing Jews from three different synagogues at the same time. Right? He had an active ministry of outreach. He was committed. He wasn't just sitting around. So he's a deacon helping make sure that the Hellenistic, the, the Greek widows get fed. And he's got this active ministry where he's signs and wonders and, and preaching and teaching. And regardless of how the debate, the discussion, however you want to frame it, regardless of how it went, they could not overcome Stephen's arguments said that he just didn't, he never ceases to preach. He was committed, and listen, we have to be committed. 
We have to, there's things we have to be committed to. We have to be committed to the truth, the truth of Scripture, to doctrine. We have to be committed uh, to outreach, to evangelism. We have to be committed to, to loving people and caring for people. We have to be committed to loving people more than things. We have to be committed to generosity. Right there are things we have to be committed to. Ultimately, we have to commit to Jesus. Regardless of what it costs us. There's a journalist and a documentary filmmaker. His name is Robert Young Pelton. And he was in Afghanistan. And I think this was um, pre-9-11. He wrote this. He said, um, he said, when I was when I was being shelled on the front line north of Kabul, so the bombs are flying to where he's at. He's embedded with this Taliban unit. It's all pre-9-11. This is when I was being shelled on the front line north of Kabul. I asked a 23-year-old Taliban fighter, why don't we dig trenches to escape the bombardment? And he looked at me and he asked, if you didn't come here to die, why are you here? In other words, this is a soldier who believed in his cause and was willing to give it all for it, right? I am here to die if I have to. We have to be that committed. And that's kind of hard to come to grips with because we've never had to face anything remotely like that here. The lives that we live. There are people around the world in the history of the church who have had to face that. They have to be that committed that if I'm not here to die, why am I here? If I'm not willing to give it all, why I sign up? And so it's easy for us to kind of say that, right? In our air-conditioned building on comfortable chairs. Is it too air-conditioned maybe a little? But if we're not willing to give up everything, if we're not that committed, Bonhoeffer, Richard Bonhoeffer wrote, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. <laughs> grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. And I'm just telling you, we've got a town full of folks who have adopted a cheap grace. And that's why you see people who proclaim to be, oh no, I love Jesus, right? I follow Jesus. And they've got every bumper sticker and emblem. And there's no distinction between their life and the life of their neighbor who makes no profession of faith. Now, I don't believe in salvation by works, not even a little bit. But I believe genuine grace really changes us. Because genuine grace comes at a cost. We didn't pay the cost. Jesus did. We, we tend to allow any kind of resistance or any kind of inconvenience, we tend to allow it to just derail us completely. Can I, can I, can I tell you about my church? I, I'm not interested sure. Or somebody will say something about faith or about Jesus and you get a great opportunity to share the truth and then they'll say something negative and, and we shut down walk away we don't need to be rude or mean but we do need to be committed we do need to be willing to endure at least a little bit of hardship Stephen did he he had deep communion with the Holy Spirit. He had this deep commitment. But he also had deep conviction. He had deep conviction. His preaching, as far as we can tell, it was made up of with the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. And he, he taught what he had learned. Anything closely, remotely, even a little bit resembling the destruct talking about the destruction of the temple. That'd be like going to the airport in the TSA line and saying that they're making jokes about a bomb. I mean, you just don't do that. They frown upon that kind of behavior. Well, that's what it was like for Stephen to say anything about the temple and, and, and hint toward its destruction. And the same thing with the Mosaic Law. 
or the, or the rabbinic customs around the law, right? That was an, you could be punished to death for that. I mean, that was allowable. Even under Roman law, the, the Jewish leadership was given allowance for blasphemy to punish by death with no repercussions, right? This is, because that's a, an internal matter. That's an internal religious matter. And we're staying out of that, is what the Romans said. And so, Stephen was so, held such a conviction about this that he still preached the truth. He knew that Jesus had come to fulfill the law and fulfill the temple. And he knew that the whole system of sacrifices and temple worship it was about to be replaced. He held that conviction so strongly, he held it to the end. I've heard it said that a preference is something you hold, and a conviction is something that holds you. And I think that's good. Even as a church, right, we have preferences and we have convictions. And um, Unfortunately, too many churches get those things confused. And so, here's a good illustration, right? What kind of music we we play in church, or we sing in church, that we... That falls far more into the preference category. The fact that the music lifts up and glorifies Jesus above all, that's a conviction, right? That holds us. The preference... That we, that's something we hold. That's something we prefer. What kind of clothes I wear? That's a preference, right? But it's when, but it's when that becomes a conviction. As long as I'm modest, same thing for you. As long as you're modest, right? You dress how you want to, according to your preference. The conviction is modesty. The style is preference. That's kind of where I'm at on those things, and I think more or less that's where we're at as a church. It's kind of like, um, you know, we're told to always be prepared to give an answer for the reason for our hope. I heard one guy say that there's a difference between always being prepared with an answer and living a life that causes people to ask questions. <coughs> Are we committed to biblical doctrines? That we tend to hold a lot of biblical truth lightly. Especially when it starts to get offensive. Right? We don't want to be offensive. We want to be tolerant. And so we don't, we'll, we'll start de emphasizing things that are really, really important because we don't want to be offensive. We don't need to be offensive on purpose, but we do have to hold to biblical convictions. And Stephen did that, and it took him all the way to his death. I guess when it comes to convictions, we have to, how do we respond? Do we say, I know what the Bible says, but, or do we let the Bible, what it says, truly rule and reign with the truth in our lives? Do we consult church history or the church constitution or the local paper? Or the news network about where we find how we need to make our decisions, or do we trust Scripture itself? We're called to be people of godly character, especially when any kind of persecution comes our way. In fact, I would say that's when the opportunity for godly character to shine really comes. There's a song that was popular a number of years ago, and, and thanks to um, my other job at Funeral Home, I hear it far more often than I would like to hear it. It's a song called Angels Among Us. Uh, I believe there are angels among us. I know it's very sappy and sentimental, and maybe you like it, and if I've hurt your feelings, I apologize. Um, it's a terrible perspective on what who angels are and what their role is, right, and all of that. But, but our passage today does mention angels. And it says that as they had arrested Stephen, now, they've not begun to really harm him yet. He hasn't preached this stirring sermon that he's about to preach. But that 
he had the, it was like he had the face of an angel. So here's what I think. I think Stephen possessed such a godly character. He was a man of such close communion with the Holy Spirit who held such deep commitments and deep convictions that the glory of God just shone through him. People knew that he was a man of godly character because of these things. And I think that's what it means when he says that he had the countenance or he had the, the look, he had the face of an angel. We're called to be people of godly character. And that means we have to have we have to have deep communion with God, with the Holy Spirit. We have to have we have to have uh, uh, this deep commitment to the truth. We have to have deep convictions. That's what we're called to do. That's who we're called to be. We you pray with Thank you, Lord, for the life of Stephen, for the things he teaches us, just by his just by his life. Lord, I look forward to next week when we talk more about the things he said. But Father, help us to be people of godly character. Help us have deep communion with you, deep commitment to one another, to the truth, to your word, and then deep conviction that we hold to no matter what comes up like. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.